Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Tom Wagner. And every month, as you know, we strive to focus on a different department, department head, programs and services going on in county government. And today, we're real pleased to have our court commissioner with us, Mr. Ryan O'Rourke. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. How long now has it been that you've been our court commissioner? A little under three years now. A under, little under three years. So the honeymoon period's over. I guess. Ryan followed uh, Rebecca Persick, now Judge Rebecca Persick, who was our court commissioner for a number of years. And prior to that, it was Terry Burke. So I've had the pleasure of working with some good ones, and Ryan has continued, continued that stellar track record. And without question, it's never dull in the court commissioner's area with everything that you you have to work with and the people that you address each and every day. So set the stage for us a little bit, please. Tell us just a, a little bit about yourself and and the role of court commissioner. About myself, I uh, went to law school in Madison and uh, went to work as a prosecutor shortly after that in Marathon County and here in Sheboygan for three years. Um, and then I moved into uh, doing uh, government work for the counties specifically Manitowoc, uh, to focus on child protection work. And uh, then I came back here, and uh, shortly after returning here, the, uh, took on the role of court commissioner. So um, as far as what the court commissioner does, our office is a supplemental office to the circuit courts. We take on a lot of the, um, I don't want to call routine, but uh, entry level things that the circuit court would otherwise have to do to help the court system function more smoothly and process cases faster. And to you, they may feel routine, but I'm sure the people in front of you don't necessarily feel that way. So what's the difference between a court commissioner and a circuit court judge? What type of cases are you handling and you know, how does that, what's routine versus what do the circuit court judges take on? Sure. Well. Um, we're just uh, we're an offshoot of the circuit court judges. We, uh, by statute, we're only authorized to handle certain types of hearings, where the circuit court judges handle pretty much everything that uh, uh, happens at the county level. Uh, for example, in family law cases, divorces, we handle the temporary orders at the beginning, uh, and we'll handle divorces, finalizing them if they're agreed upon and stipulated. But if there's a trial. Uh, if there's motions, if there's discovery, that's the circuit court's job, and we're not authorized to do those things. So we handle the same types of cases. It's just what part or type of the case that they're in or stage that they're at as to whether or not we're authorized to handle that. And here in Sheboygan, um, the judges have pretty much uh, authorized us to do everything that's allowed under the statute for the most part. So in a situation with a divorce, and I think what the odds are or the percentages about 50 percent of people get divorced or thereabouts how many of these divorce cases are you handling or your office handling versus ultimately go on to a circuit court judge i don't know that i could give you an accurate number um if uh if the people need a temporary order we handle it right uh not everybody needs or requests a temporary order what that is is an order that uh um, uh, kind of sets the tone and the parameters of what's going to happen while the divorce is ongoing uh, as far as some of the issues related to children, finances, things of that nature. And if they agree upon all the issues, then they have their divorce finalized in front of us. But as to how what those numbers are compared to how many di uh, divorce cases never cross our desk, I'd have to know how many the yeah, I don't know that exact number. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. But you used the word earlier, routine. And from my point of view, not being a court commissioner or a judge, but I can't imagine uh, the challenge and the uh, just the experience that you have to draw from, the demeanor you need to show when you're working with couples that are going through a divorce, children involved. Uh, I have to imagine that can get pretty emotionally charged at times and, and, and be challenging to, to work through. Well, it can be. Uh, you get you get used to it from mm -hmm. a professional perspective mm -hmm. and uh, if anything is a challenge it's setting the tone in the courtroom and making sure that well it may be difficult for people and emotional it is a courtroom setting right. uh, they need to control themselves there's rules to be followed 
they may not always like what's going on, but they have to respect it and follow it. And that, that's more, it's more of a challenge to um, set the tone with that respect than it is for, uh, to process it personally. You, you, uh, at some point, it, it's, it's another case. You know, right. You treat it seriously, but it's never personal. So. As I think about my time getting to know Judge Rebecca Persick, both as family court commissioner and now as a judge, and you the last three years, you both certainly have an even keel professional demeanor, which, which serves you well. So with that said, what does it take? What qualifications does one need to be a court commissioner? Well, you have to have a law degree first. And then uh, there's not a specific set of qualifications like there's for a judge. I don't think there's any minimum age. You have to have practiced for a certain amount of time. Uh, that might either be three or five years. I don't remember exactly which one it is when I by the time I came into this job, I was well past that, so I don't know that I was paying that close of attention. Uh, and you have to have earned the respect of the judges who make the decision as to who is going to be the court commissioner. So, so the court commissioner's office is one of 19 departments, and I suppose some of our viewers might think, oh boy, how big is this department? Just how big is the court commissioner's department? Three. 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 It's one of our smallest, probably along with veteran services, and and I don't know who else. It's certainly one of our smallest, but with big responsibilities. What's the the primary mission of the of the office then? To assist the circuit courts, and help cases process through the system faster and smoothly, and and uh, I don't want to say get people the results they want, but at least uh, get their cases heard in a, a fair and efficient manner. And when you say three of you, and this is my final question before I turn it over to the chairman, um, what's the role of these three individuals? Obviously you, what, do, what does each employee do? Sure, we have an assistant court commissioner. Uh, her main focus is on uh, small claims cases. And then she also serves a research role for the circuit court judges and as, as a backup to me on some of the other types of cases when necessary. And then we have a paralegal who basically functions as our office manager. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. Tom. Thank you, Adam. Um, you talked a little bit about this, I think, with divorces and small claims. What other kind of uh, cases does your commissioner's office handle? Sure. There, there's, it, it's across the board. Um, we'll start with Mondays. Uh, <laughs> in the mornings, we're always doing uh, mental health hearings, uh, initial probable cause hearings for those for mental health commitments or uh, guardianships and protective placement hearings for adults in need of uh, decision makers or protective placement. Uh, and then uh, every day we're doing bond hearings and initial appearances in criminal cases for people who are held in custody. Uh, and let's see, moving on to uh, Tuesdays, we routinely handle paternity hearings, uh, initial hearings on cases where uh, children are born and there's not uh, a marriage or an acknowledgement of paternity at the time of the birth. Uh, so the child support agency usually brings an action to establish who the father is and set orders and, and, and rules in place for that and so we handle those. We handle initial appearances on traffic forfeitures. Um, we do weddings. We do the temporary orders and the divorces and the stipulated divorces like I've talked about. I'm sure I'm leaving out a bunch of stuff. That's quite a bit. Yeah. So I, it, so I understand that uh, some cases you take from beginning to end, and in other cases you take along the way, and you may then stop at some point because of something. You, you may have known that's as far as you could go. or Sure. We can handle cases from beginning to end. For example, you know, it depends. It's not just the type of case, but it depends on what happens with the case. Right. For example, we may have the first paternity hearing and everybody comes in, uh, father's established, they agree to everything, and for the next 18 years, they never need to come back to court because they can work through things themselves. Other cases, even if everything's agreed upon, two years from then, things will have changed, they'll need to come back to court, it may go to the circuit court, it may come to us, uh, it depends. So. Typically, we are in and out of cases, I would say, is the best way to put it. Okay. Yeah. So about how many cases do you process in a year? Do you know? Well, the numbers are on the county's website in our annual report. I could 
give you the numbers, but they're probably pretty dry. I would say it's in the thousands. thousands. Once you add in all the initial appearance and bond hearings we do in criminal cases, but not, not all those cases are, are start to finish. It's, it's we have a hearing or two associated with the case. Okay. I know you said uh, you know you don't see cases as routine, and it's certainly not this. Say for the people involved are not routine, but what do you find the most interesting or the um, most rewarding, maybe? <sighs> um, I'd say the most interesting are usually the mental health cases. Um, the most rewarding, you know, it's hard to call a case rewarding from a, a court official perspective mm -hmm. because your job isn't to seek a reward or, to, or right. to feel vindicated or validated by it. Your job is to take the facts, apply the law, mm -hmm. and, and make the best decision. Um, it's not, it's, it's dissimilar to when you're working as an attorney and winning a case and producing the right result feels like a reward. Uh, as a court official, you're supposed to be a little more detached. Uh, I don't know that I'd call any of them particularly rewarding. Uh, the cases that I feel the most pressure in, I would say, would be cases related to child, child protection and, sure. and looking out for what's best for, for children that find themselves caught up in the system. Sure. Well, we'll switch to something maybe a little more positive that maybe could be rewarding is when you marry people and, uh, you know, you do this at the courthouse or on site, or exactly how does that occur? Well, if they're getting married by the court commissioner's office, we do it on site at the courtroom. Uh, we usually do them Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and they're fairly short weddings. Um, they're 15 minute time slots, so we don't do elaborate ceremonies. Um, but uh, yeah, if they want an off site wedding, there's a list of court officials that I think they can get from the county clerk's office. Okay. Uh, that will come out and do the wedding on, on site if it's not at the courthouse. And so is there a charge for getting married in, in your courtroom? It's $40 to rent the courtroom for that 15-minute uh, time period. Okay. And I understand your department also mediates divorces, which obviously is the other end of that. Uh, please, could you tell us a little bit about your mediation program? Sure. We have a mediation program. It's, it's divorces or uh, anytime there's minor children involved in a legal relationship. In other words, uh, paternity actions, you don't necessarily have a divorce because they may never have been married, but we'll still mediate those. Um, anytime you have custody and physical placement disputes between parents of the children, and sometimes even grandparents can get involved in that sure. under the right circumstances, uh, they can get either court ordered to mediation or they can come in and apply for mediation and we'll send them to uh, a mediator that we contract with. We have five currently, and they're professional counselors in the community. We're probably one of the only counties that uses exclusively counselors. A lot of places will use attorneys, too. Uh, and then the mediator will try and help them uh, work through their issues um, and reach a solution that works for both parties. A mediator is not really there to decide what's right or wrong, but just help the parties work through their issues, if it's even possible, uh, to come to a compromise. Uh, and then if they reach an agreement and the judge is willing to approve the agreement, they have their new court order. Um, if they don't reach an agreement, then they have to go through the court, more formal court system in trying to resolve their disputes. Okay. Thank you. Adam? A yeah, follow-up question on the, if they reach an agreement, then the judge approves that. Are there ever any instances where a couple will reach an agreement, but the judge won't approve it? I think judges like to respect the wishes of the parties for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I've seen a couple times where, where judges have rejected the agreement. It can be something as, as technical as the, the language in the agreement doesn't mm -hmm. match what's required under the law. Uh, or it could be that the judge really doesn't believe this agreement is what's in the best interest of the child. Felt it was the, too one-sided or something. It's usually because the judge has some background information about one of the parents that might, meet, might create a situation where they don't believe the child's in a safe environment. Yeah, interesting. Typically, they're, they're approved. So you went into the role of public service, and I understand that your family is uh, very engaged in public service as well. Your wife was just elected a judge. She was? She was. Yeah. So if she's a judge and you're a court commissioner, does this further diminish your ability to have any say at home, or how, how does that work? You know, she's going to have an investiture. <laughs> it's funny that you asked it. She's going to have an investiture ceremony soon, which is the official ceremony where she gets sworn in and puts on her robe. 
and I'm probably going to have to talk at that. <laughs> and I've been thinking about what I'm going to say, and, and, and the story I've been thinking about telling is I, I'm a bit of a smart aleck sometimes, and, and after I started work as the court commissioner, it was weird to me. Uh, technically, people don't have to do this, but when you walk into the courtroom, people stand, right. and they call you your honor. Some of them even call you judge, even though technically that's wrong too. And I thought, well, this is really weird, but when I got home, maybe I can use this. So I walked into the room and went, <clears throat> <laughs> my kids and my wife just kind of looked at me. Like, you know, you're supposed to stand when I walk in the room. <laughs> sure, How did that work in the long <laughs> It didn't work, but now, I, now I'm thinking I'm really going to regret that joke. Because <laughs> by rights, you do stand for she the judge. Me yes, yes. yes. Well, congratulations to, to you and your family. I think it's incredibly honorable work. And, and I'll go back to the, the question Tom posed to you. You know, as you said, you, you, you can't, it's not about picking sides or hoping for one uh, ruling or another. But obviously, you wouldn't be doing this kind of work if you didn't take some satisfaction from it. I mean, what, what drives you? What's, what's motivated you to become a court commissioner? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I, I can tell you what motivated me early on in my work as a prosecutor and uh, to be a child protection attorney, and that was to try and produce the right result in the courtroom, mm -hmm. as I saw, as I saw it at least. Um, it, those jobs are rare in the fact that uh, you don't have a client necessarily. Your job is to go into the courtroom and represent the interests of the public and try and produce. Uh, the best result for, for the public. You're not representing any individual interest. And as a court commissioner, it, it's a similar role in that uh, you're still a public servant and uh, you still have a, a tremendous amount of discretion to still try and produce a result uh, that benefits not only the, all the parties involved, uh, but is uh, beneficial to the community as a whole and the health of the community. But you are somewhat constrained sometimes by, by the law as to whether that result necessarily fits with what the law allows you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there's a little more um, trying to think of how to phrase this right. There's a little more constraint. Not, not that there isn't in those other positions either, because you still have to follow the law. You can't just run around and do whatever you want. Right. Um, you know what? I forgot what you asked. <laughs> <laughs> I got through all this. Well, what, what drives me? What to drives that? you? I, sure. What gives you satisfaction? I think uh, Judge Persick put it best when she described the job is even if even if your decision isn't perfect often you're taking people's lives who are in chaos and at least providing them some order and structure into those lives so they can move forward mm -hmm. I, that, I think that's a pretty good summary of, of what we do yeah. uh, and, and what drives us to do what we do is yeah. uh, you take disputes and, and you try and resolve them according to the law and hopefully that whether it's the result they wanted, that gives them some peace of mind to, to move forward and know what, what the structure is ahead of them that they right. have to deal with. I mean, it's a profession definitely to be respected because there's so much responsibility. And as you said, you're, you're impacting lives and, and often in a very significant way. So as you think about the court system and your experience with it, both as a prosecutor and as a court commissioner and looking forward, where do you see that we have opportunities for improvement or that or there are challenges coming our way that we need to make sure we prepare for? Well, opportunities for improvement are all around uh, as far as um, clarifying laws and, and you know everybody has their own personal opinion as to the way laws should be written or improved. Personally, I think child protection laws could be uh, improved greatly. Mm -hmm. uh, mental health laws could be improved greatly. But I'm not a legislator. That's not really my job is to take the law and apply it, not to just, you know, right. write it or decide what it is. Right. So there's tremendous room for improvement. 
but that's not necessarily my my role. Not that the court system can't approve efficiency on its own. Um, as far as uh, challenges in the future, I, th I think that's again driven by the legislature. Uh, there's always the challenge of uh, new laws, new mandates being placed upon the judicial system uh, and the correctional system. Uh, you know, increasing mandatory minimums, uh, all these things that drive the workload up higher and higher and higher, and those aren't always uh, funded or thought through how people are going to pay for them. Right. And the workload increases and increases and increases, and then sometimes the quality then decreases as a result because uh, people can only do so much. Right. I don't really feel that pressure in our office necessarily, but I, I've seen it in the uh, just under 20 years I've worked in, in the criminal justice system uh, mm -hmm. for district attorney's office and child protection systems, just being overloaded and, uh, and not properly staffed. Yeah, Joel Armansky, as you know, was, right. go ahead. No, I'm just gonna ask, uh, I, I get it with the circuit court, but uh, in your situation, if one of the parties doesn't agree with your decision, which can happen, obviously, I would assume, uh, who do they appeal to, or what is, the, what is the situation in that regard? It would typically be the circuit court. It, they go to the circuit yeah. court. There's a process called the de novo hearing for most of the things okay, we I've do. I've heard of that. Yeah, they can just file a de novo request with the judge, and the judge will hold a brand new hearing. Now, that's not everything. I mean, a lot of the stuff we do is, is more procedural in nature than okay. an actual evidentiary hearing. Uh, but if it's an evidentiary hearing where we're making findings and issuing rulings, uh, then yeah, the de novo hearing is the process. Okay, thank you. Going back to the challenges and and you know, as you said, there's only so much time in the day, and the caseloads have gone up. And I know uh, Joe DiCecco was always uh, requesting additional resources from the state because our state prosecutors are all state funded, so they rely on state resources. And and Joe was good about beating the drum. wasn't necessary. Very successful in garnering additional state resources. Nor have most counties. And now we have Joel Armansky who also has been beating that drum and uh, had some success or the state legislature had a bill where they were going to provide more prosecutors, more funding for prosecutors. Ultimately that did not uh, reach the governor's desk. And uh, the county board stepped up and provided a part-time district attorney position who has been very helpful in helping with foster children placement. But you know to your point of challenges um, I know that Joel just, just this week shared with me that uh, the turnover in the off office, open positions, growing caseload, uh, it's, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. It's very challenging. And of course, that's going to have a trickle effect on the entire court system, is it not? It will. And it's, it's not just prosecutors. It's public defenders. It's the pay rate public defenders are provided for uh, private attorneys who take public defender cases. I think I read an article the other day that it's the lowest or second lowest in the nation. Um, it's social workers. Uh, it, it, it's, it's pressure on, on, on everybody. Um, you know, and sometimes by investing in the system, you can actually save money. And, and the, the county prosecutor is a perfect example because my understanding of that is it's focused on... Um, child protection cases Correct. and right. achieving permanence for those children. Exactly. And if you do that, you move them out of the foster care system, which is a huge cost upon the county. Right. Uh, so by actually funding the resources necessary to move those cases through and get them done, you're actually saving the county money. Right. I'm very glad you brought that up because that was one of the critical points of why it was passed by the county board and with a little long-term thinking that yes you're going to, have to put some money up front but in the long run you'll be saving money and frankly pretty quickly well, and it's not and the benefits go beyond money too exactly I mean, when you right. human terms take all those children and get and give them some permanence to their lives uh, while the outcomes aren't guaranteed the outcome is likely to be a lot more positive right. in those situations yeah i know he's He's interested in seeing the county board do more, invest more in this area, and I think the board's going to be very empathetic to that, though at the same time we have one-size-fits-all, state-imposed levy caps, and there are other needs, whether it's mental illness or 
the opioid crisis or law enforcement or staffing a detention center or whatever it may be. But I was just reading this week, you know, the article about the Winnebago facility, the state facility, which mm -hmm. appears to have some real challenges with staffing and level of care. And, and you know, there's been a there's been so much emphasis at the state level about holding the line or reducing taxes, but are we doing it to a point where we're not providing the care or we're not making the right investment so it ends up being more expensive regardless? Transportation system is an excellent example. The county board stepped here to t up here to take care of our transportation system. At the state level, they continue to let it deteriorate, and it's going to be a heck of a lot more expensive down the road to repair. Well, I appreciate some of the insight that you've shared with our viewers today about the court commissioner's office. Again, I appreciate the work that you do, Ryan, and, and your staff. And you may be a small office, but you have a big impact on the lives of people in this community. And what day is it that you generally have the weddings? Is it Thursday or Friday? Friday. Friday. And the people that I see occasionally coming and going in the parking lot and, and the smiles on their faces and you know, from, from A to Z, you're involved in so many different things, and, and we appreciate your work. Thank you. They are the happiest people I see going into the courthouse. I have to say that. <laughs> yes. It's not a side note. Yes. I would they're happy coming out of the courthouse. <laughs> I would agree. I would agree. Well, thank you. Ryan O'Rourke, Family Court Commissioner, been with us now for about three years. Ryan, if anyone has further questions, if they see this and want to ask a question about your department, or I suppose going to the website is a good opportunity to get in information as well, but any recommendation there? I know you can't give legal advice, obviously, but if people have questions about your department, who do they call? Well, we, we have a, a, a main line. I couldn't tell you the phone number off the top of my head, but it's on the, it's website, on the website. And the paralegal yep. would answer that, and yep. she could give out any information that was Or necessary. if you contact our county clerk's office, they can always refer you to any of the 19 departments and make sure you get the information you need. Well, again, Ryan, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for joining us. We appreciate your time and hope you got a little insight about one of our 19 departments. Next month, Jim Tabeast will be here. Our a director of building services and Jim has had his hands full. We recently built our new transportation complex consolidating three facilities into one. Going to have an open house on June 15th so we encourage you to come out. It's open to the public and Jim will be here next month to talk about not only the transportation complex but some other buildings and work that's being done in the county. So until then have a good summer. We'll see you next month and hope to see you on June 15th. Thank you.